I want to get started. Every Congressional Black Caucus weekend, one of my forums is also, is always uh, about statehood. And uh, uh, this time, uh, the statehood forum uh, will feature a breakthrough of the kind we have never had since I've been having these CBC forums. So I am particularly appreciative uh, for the the uh, three friends who've agreed to come to this forum. The breakthrough I'm speaking of is the so-called statehood yes uh, breakthrough. You see these signs just like you see signs that say vote for Eleanor. <laughs> you see signs that say statehood yes. So why is it saying that? Well, you are familiar with the Tennessee plan because the mayor and the council have been speaking about it for some time, where the district is trying to clear away all of the prerequisites instead of waiting till after a vote on statehood to deal with all the prerequisites in this vote. A vote uh, for a constitution, for the new state, and a vote uh, for statehood itself. And the district may have voted for statehood once before, but not in a very long time, and not since I've been to Congress. So this would be a breakthrough uh, all on its own. But an even more important breakthrough has occurred because the local Republican Party, the DC Republican Party, has made it clear that it supports statehood. Now, I don't think I'm gonna get very far in the Congress, and I don't mean to suggest that statehood is around the corner in the Congress, but I'm not going to get very far if, even if Congress is not controlled by Republicans, if I can't show that Republicans uh, in this city too want equality with other American citizens. They want the vote in the House and the Senate. They don't want Congress interfering with their business. Uh, they want all that it takes to be a full citizen and be recognized as such by the United States of America. And we have tried many iterations on this. <laughs> and I think we all are convinced that there is nothing left except statehood if you want to be a full citizen. That is not to say we aren't trying to get budget autonomy, for example. It's another initiative from the District of Columbia that is pending now, and I'm trying to keep the Congress from overturning, but the residents of the District of Columbia have voted for a budget autonomy referendum. And as I speak, that has not been overturned by the Congress, although the House has tried to do so, the Senate has not, and I'm trying to at least keep the budget referendum in play, even if Congress decides to appropriate our funds. Chairman Mendelson and the, Cong and the Council have moved ahead on their own, without submitting their budget to the president to be submitted uh, to Congress. These are two important breakthroughs, and that's why we call this new paths to getting to statehood and budget autonomy. I can tell you if we get budget autonomy, which is probably the most important element of statehood, I'll take it, <laughs> even if I can't get statehood tomorrow. The closer we get to statehood, the easier it will be to get statehood. That's by way of, of opening up what this, um, what this panel is about and reminding everyone that they're not going to be, they're not just voting for uh, Hillary Clinton, I trust, and even Eleanor Holmes Norton. They're voting for statehood this time and they're voting on the Constitution. Uh, so it makes good sense to begin with the chairman of our council, my good friend Phil Mendelson who is key to the statehood effort now underway. He uh, graduated, as, as it were, from a at-large council member to become chair of the council. And it's, it's interesting to note that when a vacancy was created, he was made with the department of the uh, departure of the previous chairman. He was selected by his own colleagues uh, to be chairman of the council and then 
he went before the people and, ele and was elected as chair of the council. So I am very pleased, and you can speak from your seat, Chairman M M Mendelson, to introduce as our first speaker, your chairman of the DC City Council. Thank you, uh, Eleanor. I guess this is working. Um, let me begin by saying this. I think it's completely appropriate. Thank you all for being here. I'll begin with that. And then say I think it's completely appropriate that this is a topic for the, uh, the week of the Congressional Black Caucus because if anybody knows anything about democracy and civil rights, it's the Cong Congressional Black Caucus. If you look around the world, the District of Columbia is unique. We stand in isolation. We stand in isolation, well, we're unique in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways that we're proud of, but we're unique in a way that we're not proud of, and that is we are the only national capital of a free country in the world where there is not representation in the national legislature. And not only is there not representation in the national legislature, but our national legislature legislates regarding the district all the time. So while Eleanor Holmes Norton does a great job with the tools that she's got, we don't have the two members of, in the Senate who are sitting at the table, and we don't have a voting member in the House of Representatives who can sit at the table. Uh, and that's true, when I say that's true, I mean it, it, we are the exception in the free world. And we are actually the exception in most of the unfree world. As I recall, there are a couple of countries, uh, North Korea is one of them, I think there's one or two others, where uh, the national, citizens of the national capital have the same status that we have in the District of Columbia. I fundamentally believe that uh, we as citizens of the District of Columbia are the same as citizens in each of the states. And if we're the same as citizens in the state, I mean, we all think, we all think we're the same as those in Maryland and Wyoming and California. And so we ought to have the same rights and responsibilities that the citizens of the states have. And that's what the statehood movement's about. But I think I want to speak first about the issue of budget autonomy. And I will put it in this context, since this is a bit of a discussion. And there's been some debate over the years, over the last decades, about how we approach statehood and getting full citizenship for the residents of the district. Do we do it going, uh, waiting for and fighting for full enfranchisement, or do we do take a more incremental approach? And you know, to use the words incremental approach sounds a little bit demeaning, but on the other hand, there's a certain amount of practicality to it. So what we have done most recently is uh, to approve budget autonomy. Um, budget autonomy means that the council of the District of Columbia working with the mayor adopts the budget for the district. That's our local funds budget. That's roughly $7 billion. And uh, that we do it in the same way that we adopt every law that we consider. And that is that the council votes twice. It goes to the mayor. The mayor signs or vetoes. It goes to Congress for a 30-day review. And to be sure, I got to say that, you know, council, that Congress does in the, the 30 day review the same thing they've done in the past couple of decades with regard to our budget, and that is nothing. Uh, Congress actually, with regard to our budget, has failed to adopt our budget on time once in the last 20 years. Fiscal year starts October 1st. They don't approve our budget before the start of the fiscal year. That's how little importance the district is in terms of our. This, this appropriation that's so important to some members of Congress. Um, and they haven't made any amendments since the control board went away. Um, budget autonomy, I testified before the uh, Cong uh, Congressional Committee uh, a couple of months ago, ba back in May, and I said, why is budget autonomy a good thing? There are many reasons. It allows us to adopt our budget more quickly. It allows us to make changes, especially reductions in an economic downturn. Uh, it allows us to move quickly to implement a solution to emerging service needs, for instance, responding to a spike in homicides. It gives us flexibility to change our fiscal year so as to better align it with the school year or the fiscal year of regional authorities. It also gives us the flexibility to budget or spend across fiscal years, such as rewarding program managers who save funds by allowing them to carry those funds forward. Budget autonomy also uh, severs our, uh, budget autonomy severs our ability to spend from the uncertainties of the federal appropriation process, which is, to put it bluntly, government shutdowns uh, and the failure to appropriate timely. Budget autonomy also enables us to tighten the period between budget preparation and implementation, 
Currently, the budget beginning October 1st is adopted four months earlier in May based on revenue estimates prepared seven months earlier, that is February. All of these positives can be summed up in one simple fact. Budget autonomy helps our credit rating on Wall Street. Being tied to the federal appropriations process is a negative rating factor. That's what budget autonomy is about. Uh, and so we've approved it. We went through the process uh, that the Home Rule Act uh, provides. Uh, it was challenged. Uh, we went to court. We'll allow court to decide whether uh, it w what we did was consistent with the uh, Home Rule Act. With the court uh, uh, said that it was. So budget autonomy is the law of the land, even though there's some in Congress who claim that somehow we're violating the Constitution, uh, which could nothing could be farther from the case. So let me just go back to statehood for a second. Uh, as as the congresswoman noted, uh, Mayor Bowser uh, a few months ago. Uh, initiated a new or, or announced a new initiative to um, uh, follow the Tennessee plan to petition Congress for statehood. And a lot of energy has been put to this. The goal is that in January when we have a new president and a new Congress that we are in a position to present to them a petition for statehood together with a constitution and uh, with uh, boundaries and a referendum in which among other things the citizens of the district uh, state agree, assuming the referendum passes, that they agree to the same uh, fundamental questions that Congress has asked of citizens in the territories when they were admitted, such as that we agree that the new state shall guarantee an elected representative form of government, um, and that the citizens agree that the district should be admitted to the Union as the state of New Columbia. So that's what will be on the ballot this uh, November. Uh, whether the uh, citizens approve of our pursuing statehood, which I think they will. Um, it's going to be a long process, and ultimately, I think for us to succeed, there's going to be a lot more work that's necessary in the different states to uh, put pressure on the members of Congress and the, um, and the members of Congress to uh, agree that they need to put uh, fundamental civil rights uh, above partisanship and give the residents, the citizens of the nation's capital, uh, full citizenship in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman Mendelson, for that uh, introduction to the effort we are uh, engaged in. I'm going to ask uh, Patrick Mara, the Executive Director of the Republican Party, to speak next. Um, Patrick has been an elected official. He served on the D.C. Board of uh, Education, uh, representing Ward 1, and, and his peers chose him to represent the District of Columbia at that time, also on the National Association of State Boards of Education, which is the uh, national association which helps shape education policy. Uh, Patrick Mara has worked on Capitol Hill. He is deeply familiar with uh, both the federal process, the congressional process, and as a Washingtonian with our own. Um, he, he has many, many uh, services besides his service to the Republican Party, including on the Board of Governors of one of our charter schools, the Washington Latin Public Charter School. Uh, we want to hear from Patrick about the Republican Party in the District of Columbia and its decision uh, on the question of statehood. Patrick Mara. Thanks, Congressman Owen Norton. I appreciate your inviting me to be here today. Um, the D.C. Republican Party uh, for a very long time has recognized that uh, district citizens are treated uh, quite unfairly relative to the rest of America. And this could be, you could say, is dating back to one of our original precinct captains, Frederick Douglass, who was a pre precinct captain in the D.C. Republican Party uh, back in the day. We, for a, a very long time, have had in our platform uh, full voting representation, budget autonomy, legislative autonomy. Um, in fact, it was in the national platform uh, voting rights up until 1980 when it was stripped out, and we haven't been able to get it back into the national platform since. 
uh, but we do have worked uh, convention after convention to get that language back into the national platform. Uh, this cycle, uh, we, had, we had quite a battle uh, at the Republican National Convention in that we were attempting to get negative language out of the platform. Uh, our two representatives fell up short, but as I noted to the, uh, the media, the, uh, the problem with these platform committees at the Republican National Conventions is the folks that make up the platform committees are literally partially fossilized. And until they're fully fossilized, uh, we probably will not be able to get that, we will probably not be able to get that language out. So it's something we'll, we will con continue to fight for. Uh, I know, you know, when you go to, from community to community in the District of Columbia, um, everyone says, you know, something's got to be done here. Uh, there may be some folks who don't support statehood out there, but, but for those folks, I would say, you know, this is a way, this is a solid way to, at minimum, to move the ball forward. Uh, one of the issues that we face, uh, when I was elected to the, the D.C. State Board of Education, I'd go up and I would meet with uh, Republican members of the House and even Republican senators to talk about some D.C. issues. And one problem we have is that they don't always, especially since there's so much turnover in these offices uh, with staff who may staff district issues, and then on the House side, you have turnover because it's, every, it's an every uh, two-year type of deal, that members of, of the House are not always up to speed on, on these issues. If Congresswoman Norton had to go and talk to every Republican, you know, sit down, I mean, she would have... Uh, no time to do anything else in her life, uh, you know, Congress after Congress after Congress. And so one of the things I quickly recognized is that, for example, um, there was one congressman in particular, and a lot of the, on the Republican side, a lot of the Republicans, uh, their knee-jerk reaction is to say that, oh, well, you know, we should do retrocession. Um, unfortunately, this is, while this is something, it looks fantastic on paper, you know, we'll have a, you know, we'll have a city, go we'll have a city government, we'll pick up a congressional seat. Um, the, the problem is uh, the people of Maryland really don't want us. Um, and at the top of that list, the Maryland Republican Party really, really doesn't want us because it makes their, their life a lot more challenging. And their congressional delegation uh, does not want us either. So while it's, a, it's something on paper that looks like a fantastic solution, um, you know, it's kind of important to talk through these issues uh, with those policymakers who are in a, in a position to impact our situation here in the District of Columbia. Um, so the, D, the D.C. party will continue to uh, fight for the rights of district citizen, citizens, and I look to myself, I look to uh, help this effort as much as pos I possibly can uh, in, on the November 8th ballot. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Patrick. Uh, finally, we want to hear from uh, a, a man I have called a friend for a, for a very long time. Uh, indeed, Jamie Raskin was very key to my work when I first came to Congress and got Congress uh, to give us a vote in the Committee of the Whole. That is not the vote on everything, but talking about moving towards statehood, you want to get every vote you can. Uh, th I have this vote uh, and should have this vote as I speak, but it's a vote by rule of the House, and when Democrats, when Republicans take over the House, and they have been in charge of the House, most of my service in the Congress, when they take over the House, they do something really, uh, really uh, unheard of in the world. They actually take back the vote that the district won. Now, we won that vote when the Democrats were in power when I first came to Congress, when we got the House for another four years recently. I, I got the vote back. Uh, it is a very faithless way uh, to deal with the charter of the United States of America. Because when I first got, won that vote, the Republicans sued. And it went to the district court, and we won. It went to the Court of Appeals, and we won. The courts held that it was in the discretion of the House of Representatives that I had the vote in committee, and I stress that of all the votes I have, that might be the most important, because the work is done by the time it goes to the House floor. It is a, a disgrace 
and a slap in the <laughs> Uh, in the pocketbook of the District of Columbia that we don't have the vote. Uh, because the district uh, is not just taxation without representation, it's number one per capita in the United States in taxes paid to support the government of the United States without representation. Uh, we're right up there. We've more than earned our way. And now, uh, State Senator Jamie Raskin, and I see he's still carrying around uh, something that says Jamie Raskin for Congress. Uh, uh, Jamie and I always had in, in common that we were both professors of law. That was my full time. I still teach one, one course at Georgetown. <laughs> but that we were both professors of law. Now we have two things in common. We are both, come January, members of the House and Representatives, if he wins and if I win. Jamie Raskin. Uh, <clears throat> Congresswoman Norton, thank you so much. Um, uh, I think it goes without saying, because everybody knows that Eleanor Holmes Norton has been a hero of mine and uh, a mentor and, and an idol. and. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a thrill uh, to be a constitutional law professor like Eleanor and uh, to follow her path to the U.S. House of Representatives. If, if all goes well on November 8th, then I'm not taking any vote for granted, just to be clear about that. Um, but I, I'm delighted to be here um, with everybody on the panel. Um, and uh, Patrick, uh, you, you put me in a bipartisan mood, so I wanted to start by invoking our last great Republican president, Abraham Lincoln who uh, spoke of uh, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Um, and uh, I know that the people of Washington are asking for uh, nothing more and nothing less than to participate in popular government uh, in the same way that other people participate in it. And I just want to just challenge one thing you said. I agreed, I think, with everything else, Patrick. But when you said that the people of Maryland don't want the people of D.C., in Maryland or the, the congressional delegation doesn't want people in Maryland. I don't know that to be the case. I kind of doubt that. I think the people of, in, in Maryland are very supportive of people in D.C. The reason why I support statehood is because that's what the people in D.C. are asking for now. If people change their mind and want to do what Alexandria and Arlington and Fairfax County did, I think that the people of Maryland would be very open to it. I think there's incredible historical, cultural, political, social, economic ties between Maryland and D.C. And obviously a lot of people have moved back and forth in different directions. So I, I wouldn't rule that out in any way. I mean, I, you know, I would support whatever the people of Washington want to do. And so as Congresswoman Norton says, there's a, a statehood, um, uh, a new Columbia statehood referendum that's going to be on the ballot uh, this year. And so that will be a chance for people to uh, express themselves, but I would not prejudge that question. And um, but you know, I appreciate your raising it. Um, Congressman Norton mentioned our experience working together on the Committee of the Whole, and it, it is a kind of remarkable thing to have Americans revoking voting rights progress for other Americans when you think about it. Uh, and you know, the, the the incremental progress we made. Uh, back then, Mr. Chairman, was simply to say, well, if the, the non-voting delegate and the other non-voting delegates, there are five of them because it's Puerto Rico, American Samoa, Guam, the Virgin Islands, and D.C., but if they can vote in the, the various committees, the Agriculture Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, the Transportation, Judiciary, and so on, why not the Committee of the Whole, which is the parliamentary expedient by which the House of Representatives resolves itself to do a lot of the business, and then it goes on to the constitutionally recognized House of Representatives. And so, um, so Congresswoman Norton led the fight to make it happen and made that happen, not just for her, but for the other delegates. And then when it was challenged uh, in the Michael versus Anderson case, um, the <sighs> Court of Appeals said that it was set up in such a way that if the delegates you know, made the difference in voting, there would be a revote, that that was totally fine. It was set up correctly to make it happen, but that's too much for the Republicans, even symbolically, to be having 
Congresswoman Norton voting on the floor of the House of Representatives because the, that, that's where the vote takes place, right? That's where the Committee of the Whole meets. So that, that, that's it just a, that's an insult, that's an affront. Um, so um, what I wanted to say was um, um, when politics in America is in tremendous flux right now, as everybody knows. I mean, it's a fluid moment. Um, and when we, we, we go to um, January and Congress um, returns, and if there is this vote, um, I would think that this should be a live issue for the new Congress. You know, we, we have 50 states, um, 37 of them were admitted after the original 13. And objections were leveled against the admission of almost every state back to the very beginning, right? Well, not Maine because it used to be part of Massachusetts and not Vermont, it used to be part of New York and not Texas, it used to be its own country and, you know, this one is too small and that one is too big and so on. There are always complaints that are being made. But as a political matter, um, I think we've got to be realistic about how states have come into the union. They've generally come in in pairs, kind of like uh, animals boarding Noah's Ark. They come in in twosies, right? So there's Kansas, Nebraska, and there's Hawaii, Alaska, and it's kind of a political arrangement that is made, and so I think that that's something that's got to be figured out um, if New Columbia is going to enter. Who's the partner such that there's some kind of political balance to it. Is it Puerto Rico, um, which I believe has been part of the Republican uh, platform at the last several conventions? Um, you know, is that, is that the deal? Is that the trade-off? Is that the, you know, the, the Hawaii, Alaska, Kansas, Nebraska kind of understanding uh, of our time that works? Because, you know, the, there will be things thrown at New Columbia's petition about it being too small or too urban or uh, too densely populated, you know, and so on. Again, none of those things has any constitutional significance or dimension, and all of them have been heard before in other contexts. But as a political matter, the question is, you know, who's your partner uh, in the enterprise? Um, and I would think that the moment when DC finds a partner uh, in the enterprise, and it suddenly it looks like a a practical viable option and people are in motion fighting for it, then I think that um, you'll begin to see some real uh, momentum in Congress and uh, I hope that happens. Thank you. We're going to make it happen. <laughs> I, wanna, I, I want to open this to your, your own questions or statements. Uh, I do want to say uh, in, in response on uh, on um, the, the very important point Jamie re re raised, and it is a tough issue now. This notion that every state that's been into the union, there's been uh, a pair, one Republican and one Democrat, do you hear me? Uh, and we tried that with Utah, with the House vote, and DC, got a lot of Republicans uh, and still couldn't get that done, even with that pairing where it would have been a wash and where Utah was very much with us. So now we're really trying it the hard way because we don't have any pairing and everybody's got to understand that and how do we create a new configuration that will get us uh, the vote. Uh, on Jamie's point about, because <laughs> he's such an optimist, Maryland doesn't want us, uh, which, which Patrick said, um, um, the last thing Jamie wants to say is that progressive Maryland doesn't want <laughs> D.C. to have a vote. But Patrick may be hold of something. Uh, my colleagues hold their peace. Not only do they hold their peace, because remember, some will think this involves the commuter tax, uh, but on my statehood bill, where we have a record number in the Senate and record number in the House, the four senators from Maryland and Virginia are co-sponsors. I cannot say what will happen and whether at some point we have to face 
the commuter tax issue, I can tell you that it would be very difficult <laughs> for people to vote to, to let the, the district tax, tax them. Uh, but the wonderful cooperation we're getting from the Maryland delegation, from the Virginia delegation, the Senate and the House is, is terrific, at least from, from the, the Democrats. And finally, before we go, we, 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 we throw it open. The chairman of the Statehood Yes campaign is also a Republican. I don't believe I mentioned that. George Vandenberg, who is a retired AOL executive and a philanthropist. So, you, you, you know, I, I'd be pleased, whoever would lead it. But this is someone who's prepared to also go out and get us funding. And in addition to his own pedigree as a Republican. So let's hear from you. Do you have any questions or is there something you want to say about the present campaign or, or about statehood? Yes, sir. Who has the microphone to carry? Oh, uh, my name is Derek Musgrove, uh, president of Ward 4. And I'm really interested in uh, hearing from Terry Middleton and Congresswoman North about the congressional strategy after the Constitution gets to the local elections uh, on November 8th. Um, 1993, there's a statehood bill up, had Democrats in White House and in Congress, failed miserably, got 150 votes. Um, I don't understand why things would be different this time. Uh, Clinton in the White House then, hopefully Clinton in the White House this time. Um, so I'm wondering what mechanisms uh, you all are creating to actually force people's hands uh, to get people who are on the fence or don't care or who are outright opposed uh, to vote for a bill that in the past they have consistently opposed. Well, first I should say you, you completely underplay what happened in the, Sen in, in the Senate and which was the, uh, sorry, happened in 1993. At that time, Democrats had control of the House for 40 years. Newt Gingrich and the Republicans took over after two years, my first two years in the Congress. Uh, that was the first ever statehood vote. I've named some of the issues, even for Democrats, on statehood. Um, for example, the notion of the commuter tax and the rest. Um, and yet, we got uh, a supermajority of the Democrats, including Southern Democrats. And that was uh, unheard of. Um, we got one Republican even, by the way, from Maryland. With that, we were on our way. We, were, we had gotten the first vote ever for statehood. It had been a resounding vote. So we were going to the next step. So you can count the number of people who didn't vote for us, most of them Republican, if you want to. But the way in which you're gonna get statehood is building on a vote like that. What kept us from building on that vote where we got a supermajority of the Democrats uh, and only one Republican, what kept us from doing that? <laughs> Republicans took over. And therefore, <laughs> we were back almost to ground zero. That's what got us back to the House vote, at least. Uh, so it's not going to happen that way, you know? <laughs> and all of a sudden, uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, decide to get statehood. We're going to have to work our way to statehood. So our strategy has been to improve what we've done each time. For example, we hold ourselves to the goal of improving each year the number of co-sponsors over what we got the last year. We held ourselves to the goal of a Senate, a Senate hearing. In 1993, there was a hearing, but it wasn't an official hearing. Four years ago, we got the first official hearing uh, in the Senate of the United States. It was controlled by Democrats. We got that hearing. Um, so it's on the map in, in both houses not now. So unless the district is, and its residents and its public officials are prepared to build year by year uh, on a strategy that moves us forward to statehood, saying what your goals are for each and every year, <laughs> it doesn't pop out that way. Ask uh, women 
And did you ought to ask yourself, why did it take to 1920 for women to get the vote? What's wrong with you? After all, even black men, in theory, got the vote with the 14th Amendment. Most of these would have been white women. They would have been the mothers of the white men who wouldn't give them the vote. <laughs> they slept with the white men who didn't give them the vote as their wives. So I suppose the, 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 the moral of this story is, I don't care who you think you are. <laughs> Whether you think you are the creme de la creme of society, this Congress gives nobody anything uh, that they don't work for. White men didn't have the vote. Only propertyed white men had the vote. So how did the white men get the vote? Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that every single group has had to fight their way to democracy in this, in this country. So instead of saying, oh, what happened? You all didn't get everything you're entitled to when you went out for it. Uh, residents have to say, how do we move this ball so that we're not pushed back each year? How do we keep it going up until they can't do anything but give us statehood? And what the district has done now and what the Republican Party has done now is to come on board officially and said, this is a bipartisan move now. Take that and do something with it. Let me take a stab at the question. I want to begin by butchering a, a famous quotation, something to the effect of power seeds nothing without a struggle. And I think that's what uh, Eleanor just referred to. Um, and it's not unusual in legislatures that uh, on issues, particularly controversial ones, that there'll be a vote year after year after year. I don't think, you know, implicit in the question is that uh, um, we didn't get a, a majority of the votes 20, 30, 20 years ago, and so um, are we going to do anything any better now? And maybe we shouldn't be pushing. That's certainly not what you said, but I think that's no, one way. But it is one way to address the question. I think that uh, this effort has been renewed, and uh, we should uh, pursue it. And there is some new energy around this, and I think all that's good. I do think that there's a problem that uh, there's what I will call, this may be too harsh a word, but apathy among district residents. We have lived without full citizenship for a long, long time, and so there isn't the anger about it that you see in some civil rights movements. Um, and we have to figure out how we can change that. And, I, and it's certainly not easy. I've been great, tried it when there were the demonstrations and 40 people were arrested on Capitol Hill. Sharon Pratt Kelly tried it, but 20 years earlier, with um, getting arrested on Capitol Hill. Um, I have said for a long time that often the discussion about statehood and strategies is a discussion that we have among ourselves when the discussion really needs to occur between us and the, 50, the citizens of the 50 states. And I won't sit here and say that we have a great strategy for how we're going to build support among the 50 states, but we need to do that. We need to do that. And there, you know, there's some structure in place to do that, such as DC vote. Uh, the mayor's put more effort into this with her um, office of, I guess, federal relations. Is that what we call it these days? And um, so you know, there is some infrastructure in place, but there really needs to be much more discussion, focus on a, strat a national strategy. Congressman Norton can only do so much, and she does a lot. And so maybe she could talk to all 435 members of the House in the next week. I, it's a little hard to do that many in a week. And talk them into But it. really, they're going to need pressure from their constituencies. And that is figuring out how we put pressure on the residents of Wyoming or Idaho or the 23rd district in California. The, um, the, good afternoon. My name is Ricky McLean, a Washingtonian, 49 years old, living in Ward. Six, um, I came today, um, we've been fighting the statehood all my life, and um, it seemed like we're not going any further, but if they're not going to allow us to have statehood, have we ever thought about pushing and saying withholding taxes completely as for the federal government? 
because if we don't have statehood, why should we be paying federal taxes to, because we're not a state, so we shouldn't be paying federal taxes. Have we ever looked at saying, can we withhold those taxes as the residents until we have a vote? You gotta have some leverage. If we don't pay taxes, what are they gonna do? If the, gov if the mayor, the council saying every resident of the city is can withhold their federal taxes. Now, what is the government? Now you put the ball in the government's court to saying, okay, now we got to put a vote on this now. We have we thought about saying, you got to be able to put something on the table saying, to make them fight back. Because if we keep on saying we're going to vote, we want a statehood, we want a statehood, well, okay, let's not give none of our federal dollars that we paying the highest tax rate in America. Let's not get hold, withhold that money. Other states do it. Other places do it. But that's what we need to do. We got to have some leverage to fight, to fight this fight. Has there, I'll be the first to take a stab at this. Has that ever been discussed? Yes, it has been discussed. And it's been discussed uh, periodically over the last several decades. Uh, generally, those who have uh, been supporting statehood have rejected the idea of our, not, of our withholding taxes. I suppose if you could take it to its extreme and all 676,000 residents at one time agreed that they would not file their federal income taxes, uh, that that might have some effect. Um, it's pretty hard to coordinate that to do that, uh, and it would be tantamount to a massive civil disobedience, and there are other ways Otherwise to known as a felony. That's true. <laughs> and we have the leadership to help promote that. Well, saying, but, but elect, get it. Saying, as Eleanor said, it, it is a, a crime to not file. So if everybody were to do it, but if I stood up and I said, uh, if members of the council stood up and said, uh, withhold your taxes, there wouldn't be enough to do that. There would be enough to be arrested, but not enough to make so a they difference. So everybody in the whole city, though. Sir, you're not hearing let, let, him. Uh, you you're really hearing aren't him. hearing him. Let, 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 let me uh, chime in. <laughs> Uh, um, I think Phil himself said there's a, certain, there's a certain amount of apathy in the District of Columbia. He sure wasn't talking about getting arrested for not paying taxes. And the apathy he was talking about was the not that people don't care. It comes with more than 200 years of fighting a fight. It's very hard to keep a fight going with everybody up and for 200 years. And one of the things the district has to do and has begun to do with this council and mayoral-led effort is to not fight episodically. We had people to get arrested after president, uh, indeed, uh, <laughs> gave back something, and, and, and he may have had to do it. But he was quoted in the worst way, I'll give you the District of Columbia. It was when abortion got back into our appropriation. And uh, every member of the council came out and were arrested. That was fabulous. Problem with it is uh, after that, what are you going to do? And what I see here, and I've asked be done, is after this is done and we get the vote, what is your next effort to keep it going so that we don't slip back into doing nothing until we get fired up again? They love that. They love you to get fired out and go away. And then they said, you know what? Uh, don't worry about it. It won't, it won't last. So what two mayors did, very important in leading that effort and our mistake, we didn't find a way to keep it going. To your point, let me tell you, I got so frustrated that in my early years in Congress, I actually put in a bill to say take away the taxes. There were maybe three Republicans who got on that bill with me. They want your four billion dollars. If you think that in a budget of several trillion dollars they give a, a, a darn about our little bit of money in there, I'm here to tell you differently. In exchange for a vote, in exchange for two senators, <laughs> not really, uh, it's not that easy. But the hardest thing is I am not about to ask everybody, and I, it's not going to happen. I don't, I'm not sure you do it. I am not about to say to everybody, um, go for several years and don't pay your federal income taxes. Wow, <laughs> by the way, the interest mounts, so then you're liable for that. And when you still don't do it, go to jail on that and leave your family to fend the best way they can. That's the hardest way to get people involved. I 
think we got a lot of easier ways. But the easier ways have not accomplished. Well, we haven't tried all the, what, this, this new way that the council is doing, if we carry that to the next step. Your impatience is well put, uh, but again, uh, Phil was saying he doubts that you would get enough people for it to matter. And, and it's one thing to advocate, there's another thing to say, here's my taxes right now, this is what I'm gonna do next year. And I'm not gonna ask anybody to do that before I ask them to do another, a number of other things. Let's, let's go on to the next question, I think we've, we, I, I very much appreciate that question because it is a very important way, but the leverage we have is very slight compared to the budget of the, of the United States of America. Did you want to say something? Can I just add well, just one or two things, Ricky? Thank you for that question. Um, the first is that there was a tax protest litigation like 175 years ago by people in D.C. I think it's called the Loughborough case, where the court came back and said, you're asserting no taxation without representation. And the court said, that was the slogan of the revolution, but it's not a constitutional principle. We tax a lot of people who aren't represented. You know, we tax children. At that point, we tax women. We, t we tax a lot of people who can't vote. So the, so the direct way failed. But the sentiment that you expressed is one that has repeatedly come up you know, over the last two centuries, I believe that, I don't know, it would be worth asking, you know, one of our pro bono firms that are interested in the DC voting issue to look at it. I believe there's a way that if you wanted to do fiscal civil disobedience, and as uh, the chairman and the congresswoman are saying, I mean, it's obviously a very heavy thing to do, just like it's heavy to ask people to face hoses and dogs and so on. I mean, it's a heavy thing to do. But having said that, I think there might be a way where you put the money in escrow and then you, so you, you notify the IRS, you say, the money's there for you if you win it, but you've got to prove that it's not unconstitutional and then it does lead to litigation. You could get 600,000 people to do that and nobody's facing any criminal you know, consequences at that point. But I mean, you'd have to look and see specifically. And I, you know, and then it's a tactical question whether or not that moves the ball forward, as the congresswoman says. You see, he's always thinking. Yeah. Uh, I would only add, as <laughs> my constitutional friend, that the, the jeopardy is individual. Uh, and <laughs> I'm not sure the IRS would care uh, about it being there until there is a court case. The, the, the courts do not and this, this, this has got to be said, this has been tested. The courts have said that it is not unconstitutional for us to uh, be, have the status we have, paying taxes to be sure without representation. So I mean, we, 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 we have only ourselves now. <laughs> So and there, so let's do it ourselves. There is, um, if I could just add one very quick thing, there is legislation in the, on the House side right now introduced by Congressman Louis Gohmert to exempt district citizens from taxation until they receive representation, uh, which is that that legislation is supported by the DC Republican Party. But with that said, um, there aren't many co-sponsors. Uh, Congressman Gohmert's not on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the one of the committees of jurisdiction, uh, the tax committee. Uh, he's not on the, the committee with jurisdiction over DC. Um, and this is something that Congressman Norton had uh, supported in the past. Uh, but certainly since the effort is, for this cycle at least, is focused on uh, D.C. statehood, um, that bill isn't going any, there anywhere soon right now. And could I indicate why, you know, I indicated I, put, uh, I supported out of frustration, Gohmert was who put the bill in before, knowing full well the Republicans would never exchange the little bit of taxes we pay for a full vote and two senators. Uh, but I, I don't do it, you know, if, if, they, if they're taking me up, I would have been embarrassed, because I don't want it. If you get it, you will lose your per capita funding. You will be a territory. And the territories do not get the per capita funding on each and every appropriation that we get. That is to say, federal appropriation. Uh, they are always wailing about the fact that they do not get the same per capita. 50 states in the District of Columbia means funding comes to us on a per capita basis. If you are a territory, because you don't pay taxes, you do not get the same funding for highways, for HHS, and for Medicaid, for all the rest. So I don't want it <laughs> because, because I would lose, frankly, millions and over time billions of dollars in 
in, in funds that DC needs to keep going. Next, who's next? Oh, me, <laughs> hi. Uh, Stand Up for Democracy in DC, Free DC. We will be celebrating our 20th anniversary next year, fighting for DC statehood. And I really wanna say that I'm shocked. I am truly shocked that we are kind of ebb and flowing like the tide. I think a lot of it has to do with education. It's like the dirty little secret of DC and the dirty little secret of the country that you have people who have no basic rights. These are basic citizenship rights. We're not asking for anything special, but I think the fact that it's really not a part of the basic curriculum in the DC schools, it's really not part of the national curriculum that you have this lack of rights. We did a survey on the mall, and I would say seven out of 10 people, when we, they were told that the DC residents didn't have representation in Congress, couldn't tr control their own budget, uh, didn't control their own federal judges, I mean, didn't control their own local judges, didn't have basic rights, people were shocked. And I could point right there from the mall to the Capitol and say this is, and they would say, this is ridiculous. It has to be an educational program nationally, locally, and regionally. It has to be funded. I think that's one thing that's not going on. DC doesn't spend any money when they do have a project. When we have a referendum project, which is really vast when you think about it, we're talking about reaching out here locally and reaching out nationally. You need money. You've got to have money. You've got to have a professional PR uh, effort. You've got to really fund this effort and educate people. And I think if we connect DC residents to what a lack of these rights mean, that we have an HIV AIDS epidemic considered at, epi at an epidemic level, yet the Congress would not let us spend our own local funds on needle exchange, which meant that people died because we don't have this control. I think if we get those everyday issues out to people, that a lack of rights and democracy means death in some cases, people will be inspired, and people will go to jail, and people will keep fighting. But we've got to make it a real issue, not just about voting rights or, I mean, I don't want to diminish that, but it's got to be reached go to a level of life and death sometimes for people to really get out there and sacrifice. And that's all I have to say. Anise, I'm glad you, you raised needle exchange because it was 10 years before I could get that off our appropriation. What's important is that the Republicans have not tried to put it back on. But for 10 years, and you're right, the reason we have an epidemic and that Baltimore, a much poorer city, uh, has done better than we've done is because of those 10 years in which it spread because we weren't able to spend our own money. And the fact that they haven't put it back on took a lot of fight, but it was very important. On judges, federal judges, speaking of incrementalism, when Democrats are in power beginning with Clinton, I have gotten senatorial courtesy. So every judge you see, federal judge you see, lives in the District of Columbia, was not the case before. Uh, it was used for patronage. The US attorney didn't have to live in the District of Columbia. The U.S. attorney, the first bl black U.S. attorney ever named was Eric Holder, who's gone on to be Attorney General of the United States. So whatever we see, we can't let go by. Home rule, uh, even your home rule is delegated. In other words, we don't even really have home rule. Because the reason that the Congress can come in and say you can't spend your own local money is that they have delegated home rules so they can take back anything that they want to and regularly do. Marijuana is an example. Uh, we were able to find a loophole that keeps marijuana possession legally, but the council can't tax it and they can't regulate it. And not being able to regulate it, that's dangerous. Who's next? Oh. My name is Joyce Robinson Paul. And I've been fighting this fight for many, many years. As a start, when my daughter became the first page for the District of Columbia. But I'm concerned uh, that 20 years later, we have a government that will not fund 
education for our residents. We, uh, the last time I seen some RFPs, there were to um, make sure that people all over the world knew that we don't have statehood. But we have a delegation of three people that are elected by the district residents. And there's little or no funding for brochures, pamphlets, educational information, just an influx of enough information to go out to every resident of the District of Columbia. Just like the voter guy goes out, uh, the statehood problems should be addressed and sent out and let our residents know about it. I've asked the mayor's office and field minister's office, why not fund a delegation? Why not fund the three uh, representatives that, we, um, that we've elected? so that they can go out and start going to every ANC meeting, everything that's out here, to let people know about statehood for the District of Columbia. Many of the residents do not know about it. I serve on several entities and I go to bowling and, and I put word out to a lot of people and they said, oh, what's statehood? The state of a state? I said, well, that's the start. But they need information from their government. And their government is funding uh, RFPs to educate the United States of America and their residents, but not even the DC residents. Thank you. Let me uh, correct that a little bit. The, uh, for the first time, I believe it was this year, the statehood delegation, that's the two elected uh, senators, frequently called shadow senators and representative, have approximately a quarter of a million dollar budget. Uh, what they haven't done, and I've asked them to do, is to take that money or that dollar amount and out of that create a budget for what they're going to do. And they haven't done that. Uh, I've indicated that um, uh, if they could show a plan through a budget that uh, needed more money for, let's say, outreach, specific outreach, not just the word outreach, that uh, the council would be likely to give them additional dollars. But they have, um, uh, for many years, uh, all they had was the uh, checkoff, the tax checkoff. Uh, but uh, uh, they now, this year, have about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, well, could I just say, the, in, in terms of educating DC, I mean, Washington Post did a poll, shows 71% are for statehood. When we get through with this vote, I certainly hope that we improve on that. But that's 71 percent, even though there are a lot of people who move and are new to D.C. So I'm not so sure that, you know, D.C. doesn't know about it. If there's any money, I know <laughs> what I'd like it to go for. <laughs> I've already spoke to, spoken with the uh, mayor's film people after uh, there was this extraordinary <laughs> Uh, 20 minutes, DC last night. Did, did you all see that? Uh, if you haven't, you should go online and see it. Where this is John Oliver, a comic nationally, did something you will never be able to pay for. And that is he made fun of the Congress for not giving DC its rights. Using children, I mean, I can't. It's, it's, the parody is so exquisite. Uh, that uh, if you were trying to do an ad yourself, uh, you just couldn't do it. You, you don't have his kind of people at your disposal, even if you had the money to do an ad. So what I've asked uh, be done by the film people is to break that up so that we can do what we're not doing, and that is use social media. If you break that thing up and have everybody across the country laughing at the Congress, because we don't have our rights with these parodies all over the place, that's a whole lot better than us getting out there huckstering for give us the vote or trying to educate people about the vote. We know we don't have the vote. We do need the country educated. How do you educate them? And again, I, I, they're, trying to get the, uh, they're trying to get the permissions and they believe they will be able to get the permissions. But even pending that, uh, I would like to see D.C. organize itself 
so that it is regularly doing social media, not about what they haven't done to us, but so you could have a group that said, I am the, the DC social media group, and we will, be do, we will be need your suggestions three times a week. We, we will do funny things, we will do informational things, and we need your help so that we can get that out on, on social media. That's free, people. <laughs> I can tell you this much, ask Black Lives Matter. Not in DC, because we've had a, a, a much better police force in around the country. But in New York and other big cities, how did those demonstrations occur? They just got on social media and people came. I don't see DC using free social media or coordinating themselves to do so. Do so. I know our statehood senator was here. That's something they could take the leadership on and get the word out if you think not enough people know, and I agree with you, <laughs> not enough people in the United States know. I'm not sure I agree with you that people in D.C. Don't, don't know. I don't think the problem in D.C. is ignorance. I think it is activism. Who else? You pretty much took my speech. <laughs> uh, I'm Sheila Marshall, a native Washingtonian from Ward 4, and I applaud you, Congressman, and uh, Phil Mendelson, for all of your many years of service to us, and we know that you've been plowing through this issue for a very long time. I was involved with, with Common Cause back in 1970 when this was a big issue then, and I'm a regular membership payer, dues-paying member of DC Vote. And I, I so, certainly agree with you that we need a national effort. The problem is not in DC. We know what we want, and we know that we want, a we want to be a state. I think what we're not doing is reaching out nationally to our friends and families and strangers across the country. Those are the folks whose congresspersons are going to have to vote for this initiative. And most of my friends don't even know that we are not a state. Um, so I mean, as politically aware as I am, and my friends don't know, you can imagine what the people in the rest of this country don't know. I think we need initi initiatives like Black Lives Matter or something similar that's a catchphrase that everybody will be saying and the issue will be in the forefront of people's minds. And I don't think we're doing enough, and we as collective, um, nationally to make people aware that we don't have the same entitlements as other citizens in this country. And somebody's got to spearhead that effort. I don't know if it's DC Vote or somebody else or some new group. We don't need a lot of new groups. We need a group that's committed to making it happen and having a strategy to make it happen. Um, we need to figure out how to talk to the rest of the country. That's what we really need to know how to do. Through social media, I would even suggest that we get a philanthropist, an athlete, um, somebody of name recognition who will drive this effort for us and make it a national effort. And maybe we can move a little faster that way. It's been a long time, and I thank you. Thank you. I just, I'm Eugene Kinlow, and, uh, and I'm staff for the New Columbia Statehood Commission. I'm also a resident of the 8th Ward, and, and I'm encouraged by what I heard here today. I just wanted to let you know what, what we have been doing in support of the New Columbia Statehood Commission just over the last couple of weeks. We've been able to provide what we call Speakers Bureau training to educate people about statehood, and it's primarily here in Washington, D.C., because there's a big thing that's going to be on the ballot in November. And so our goal is just to educate as many people as we can. In the last couple of weeks, we've trained probably over 90 people. In just the last couple of weeks, I think we've got a training for uh, uh, students, about 50 or 60 in the next couple of weeks, about 50 members of the faith community in the next week or two. And I think, you know, of course, this makes our core strong here in Washington, D.C., uh, but our core needs to be strong before we start talking about spiraling outside of Washington, D.C. So I just want to let you know, if you wanted to be interested, if you want to get more information, just go to uh, statehood.dc.gov website. And that's uh, uh, statehood.dc.gov. Thank you. Eugene, thank you. I, I need to know, you say so you're training these people. I take it in what the referendum is about and so forth. What are they going to do once they get the training? Well, uh, 
you know, since I work for the government, I can't ask people either, either to come out and vote for it or vote against it. But good citizens can urge other citizens to do uh, just that. They can urge other citizens to support it, support well, the movement have, with well, resources. I'm trying to find out if, okay, they are trained, they know, right. they understand by that way. There is something to understand. Right. So, I understand. And, and so, so after they do it mm -hmm. and they get this training, is there a plan for them to fan out and do something with the training, find people for them to talk, talk to, et cetera? Yes, yes. We have a list of all the advisory neighborhood commission meetings by day, I think, next week. Looking at the schedule, there are 41 opportunities to speak just next week, and we're trying to match opportunities with our uh, speakers based on their geographic location or where they work or what their interests may be. Uh, but you know, we start with civic associations and ANCs, but there are other opportunities through people's block clubs, uh, through people's uh, organizations, whether uh, it's uh, uh, you know where your kids are or your schools. So there are plenty of other opportunities. Uh, we have a toolkit that's already located located on our website and it's uh, at statehood.dc.gov. Uh, we started by doing these trainings in person, 25 here, 25, 30 there. There are about five or six people here in the room that have taken the training. And we started last week and launched to do it by doing it online. So Congresswoman, we invite you to, to join us online and just to, 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 to see what it looks like. Uh, we, you know, from the comfort of, of your office or wherever you're, you have a computer, we make it really plain for folks. So How we just offer that as a service. How long is the training? Uh, no more than 20 minutes mm -hmm. online. No more than 20 minutes. Uh, we have a couple of our trainers here. Nick, is that right? Right. That, with Q&A, it's, it's, it's a little longer, but we've loaded frequently asked questions as well, so that will overcome many questions that you may have. But thank you for all, all of your hard work, and you're all heroes to me. Thank you. Here's, here's some. There's also someone down here. Um, yeah, so I've had a lot of I've had a chance to speak to a lot of citizens in Washington D.C., and I have been informed that they are for statehood, and I'm in agreement with going to other states and talking to citizens to let them know that Washington, D.C. would like statehood. There's a lot of people in other states who really love the city. They have respect for the city. And I do believe that public relations in other states would be of great help for us. I, I want to say something while you're moving the microphone over. You know, um, one of the things that uh, I would like to see is uh, with the funding that uh, we started this year with the, the, our shadow delegation, that there's more of a plan in, in this outreach to the other states. What I've seen over the years, for example, two, three years ago, members of the council went to, I believe it was New Hampshire, and uh, met with the members of one or both houses of their state legislature we actually got a resolution passed by the uh, legislature, the state legislature supporting statehood. That's pretty good. It was the only state we approached that year. And now, two, three years later, it really has no meaning. It's a different state. Uh, you know, legislatures, they change every couple of years. That needs to be thought through on a, um, a national basis. So that, uh, just to kind of toss this up, it really needs more discussion. Let's say we pick uh, 20 states next year. What 20 states? And how are we going to get reach out to them and get these resolutions and plan this over, let's say, two years? I would say three years max, but think it through and have some discussion. And I think that our, our shadow delegation is really the best place to start with that because that's what they're elected to do full time. And as I indicated before, if there's a plan like that, I think the council would uh, support uh, more funding there. We have groups in the city like D.C. Vote that the, uh, our, our delegation could work with and in that way uh, expand the resources and the, the organizations like D.C. Vote are probably in a better position to more quickly get the dollars. And we just work out this strategy. And maybe it's not visiting every s state legislature. That seems to me to be a logical approach. There might be a, another idea. But in that way, develop a campaign. But what we've done is pretty much episodic. Uh, New Hampshire is not the only state that in the last couple of decades has supported uh, uh, stated for the District of Columbia. Um, I can't tell you who else did it, but that's the point is that we do, it's like one-offs. We'll do one this year and we'll do one two years from now and that just doesn't have any impact. Donna, did you get the microphone? 
Well, this is more for Kenlow. I was I was asking the question a, p a part. Part of the training for our people to speak to people in the city. Do we have a plan to have people sp spread out across the country? Many of us are from other states, and you know we did this at one time at the convention. We spoke to other states. I was a speaker for for Pennsylvania and Ohio, and you would be surprised at people in other states that have no idea. They think that we do not pay taxes. They think that we, and some of them think that we, we are, are like a, a we don't pay taxes and, and, we, and we already have, have all the, we have representation. So what we need as far as speaking in the city, we need a group of people that uh, would be willing, even uh, you could use college students would be willing to go out across the United, Sp United States and speak to community groups, not so much the political people, but we've got to get to the grassroots because they make their politi political people work. Thank you for that question. Um, as a part of the new Columbia Statehood Commission, a number of working groups were created. Uh, anticipating to work in front of it in the short term and in the long term. In the short term, there was an all eight wards anticipating um, um, the election on November 8th. But beyond that, there was another committee that was created uh, called All 50 States. And that group has come together and created a plan and presented it to the new Columbia Statehood Commission just a couple of months ago. And I, it, it's my understanding that, that there, there are many nuggets in that plan that talk about how uh, we approach our uh, a job of reaching out to the all 50 states and or impacting uh, the legislatures in those states. Uh, I believe it is online. It's we have time for just a few more. Yes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ro Roberto. I'm a political science student in the University of Puerto Rico. So um, my question is more uh, headed to Jamie Raskin. Um, you, you mentioned uh, later that uh, maybe uh, the, the chances of disease statehood uh, to come is if, if it's come with if a pair uh, with maybe other uh, territories uh, as Puerto Rico. Um, so. How relevant is the, the 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 chances of Puerto Rico having uh, uh, becoming a state to DC, uh, and that uh, uh, regarding that Puerto Rico is considered a democratic uh, territory? Uh, so, how important is Puerto Rico in this process? Um, thanks for the question. Um, a lot of the discussion has been about educating and mobilizing people. Um, but in the final analysis, it's going to come down to a vote in Congress. Um, and uh, I think as Congresswoman Norton indicated at the beginning, um, you know, you can talk to the Republicans all you want, but in the final analysis, there's a very strict arithmetic at stake here, which is two additional senators and one or maybe two additional representatives. Um, and uh, if they're going to be Democrats, the Republicans are going to oppose it, you know. So you look for another state that conceivably could come in with New Colombia. Um, Puerto Rico, I think, is the most logical or obvious candidate. Uh, what you say is true about it being a Democratic, I mean, I think it's leaning Democratic. Um, but the Republicans have traditionally taken the position that there should be statehood for Puerto Rico, and I, and I think that obviously a lot of um, Hispanic voters are looking to see whether the Republican Party has any kind of real commitment to them or not. So I don't know what other candidates are out there, um, but I'm trying to think about it from the legislative angle now, which is you know assuming you build the momentum to really push it before Congress. You've got the education, you've got the grassroots mobilization. What are you going to need in the final analysis? And I think. Um, I don't know, again, Congresswoman Norton could correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think that you would need some kind of trade with the Republicans in order to prevent filibuster and you know, other procedural obstacles just being thrown up the way that they're blocking you know, the nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court right now. And he was the guy who wrote the opinion uh, in uh, Alexander versus Daly stating that the Constitution actually uh, 
does not make it impermissible to disenfranchise people in DC. Could I, uh, on, on that, that's, <laughs> on Puerto Rico, um, first of all, Democrats in the Congress, um, uh, Hispanics are split on what to do about Puerto Rico because of Commonwealth, Commonwealth status and not paying taxes. So that's not at all clear uh, that even Democrats in, in the Congress would, would support it. But let me tell you why it is a no-fly. Puerto Rico isn't entitled to one the way we are. Puerto Rico is entitled to six. There's no way you're going to pair six DC, seats in the house. Six yeah. seats in the house. Mm -hmm. There is no way ever that you're going to pair uh, DC with somebody who would get six as a result. That's not a pairing. So I have never, I've always written off Puerto Rico in that way. We've got to go for Puerto Rico for Puerto Rico's sake. This has got to be the last one because we're approaching Thank three, three o'clock. Yes. Much. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, I just want to make a comment. Um, unfortunately, Mr. Kimbrough, Kim, what's his name, Kimbrough? Kinlo left before I had uh, opportunity to direct uh, my concern uh, directly to him since he's representing the commission for the new state of Columbia. My concern is that for Washington, D.C., I 100% support statehood for the District of Columbia. But my concern is that there's no one really reaching out to grassroot doing, grassroot organizing here in D.C. And I remember a statement by uh, John Kennedy as well as President Obama a few years ago. They said pretty much it's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. We need to, in Washington, D.C., to educate grassroots people. We need uh, folks to rise up, leaders, uh, to talk about the benefits of statehood, you know, and also to organize and talk about what is really happening in D.C. We have a colonial form of government here in D.C. We have a constitution that was just written uh, by members in our political community. They're speaking out for us, okay? And it seems to me, it appears that our representatives here in the District of Columbia are really writing constitutions and, and legislation that benefit the, gra not the grassroots, community, but to maintain the status quo. I would like to see our representatives get, spend some of that money that they are uh, uh, spending posting up November 8 election uh, to vote for statehood, educate the grassroots community about what's really going on with this Constitution. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate well, it. Thank you very much. Uh, and I must say this has been, this has been a uh, very lively discussion of the kind. It makes me hopeful about statehood. And m many things have been brought out, of course, especially what we've learned about, I didn't know about this speaking training, so we're going to have all these ambassadors going all over our city. That is the kind of thing we need to be doing. Uh, so I appreciate all of you who came. Uh, it encourages me that you have come and have participated, and I hope it encourages you to keep moving until we get statehood. Thank you very much. <laughs>